Uh, this is Luigi de Munnik uh, from uh, UNDG DOCO. I'm here with two colleagues, Maria Blanco and Peter Sereni here. Uh, on the other end of the world, we have Gerald de Mew and Shati Shu uh, in Copenhagen from UNDP, uh, the Global ICT Advisor Unit. And uh, on the other side of the world, we have Ishmael Inan from uh, the country office, the UNDP country office in Timor Leste, Dili, Timor Leste. Um, without much further ado, we, uh, we should start. Yeah. I'm here to exchange with you why I take it is so important for all of us to be fully engaged on the UNDG business operation strategies and the common service packages. So five imperatives uh, from where I sit which I want to share with you. The first is the global strategic development imperative. With the SDG agenda we have no option but to improve the way we deliver and what we deliver to countries. To do this, you cannot think about operations and how we organize ourselves on the business front as an afterthought. This has to come right up front when one is doing strategic planning, visioning, and program design. The best of our business operations side are those who ensure that it is part of the way we work, for example, with data, the way we work with stakeholders, and the offer that we make in terms of a whole change package that makes us a better UN delivering uh, for people we serve. Now, it is also important when thinking of business operations that we should bring our UN norms and standards into what we actually deliver on the business side. So for example, using the best green technologies, looking at human rights when we discuss issues of procurement. So you see, you've got to be at the heart, at the very beginning of these conversations of the UN's role and contribution in a country. A second imperative is that the UN development system's global policy framework is underpinned by an ask from our member states of a different way of doing business operations. So for example, um, our QCPR, which is a quadrennial policy review mechanism that stands as our guiding policy uh, framework, has multiple references to what we should do on the business operations side. Let me just take a couple of them. Consolidation of support services at country level and in fact where we can to move to common United Nations service centers. That may seem like a big ask for some, but it's the direction that our member states want us to move towards. Another is to look at common support services, not just at country, but also at regional and global levels, and there are many more. Now, a third key imperative is that we have established standard operating procedures for delivering as one well, to make this easier on our country colleagues to work together across uh, many core elements of our program policies and operations. So delivering fully on the standard operating procedures also means that we've got to deliver on the business operations strategy. Now we have 54 countries today that are formally recognized by governments as delivering as one. But the standard operating procedures and the business operation strategies is for everyone. They're good business practice, so why should they be voluntary? They should be for all of us. In fact, in the new QCPR coming on, they will even take on the conversation around mutual recognition of each other's best practices, both services and products. A fourth imperative is that the results speak for themselves. 
And here, I'm not going to go into details on this, but I would urge you to look at the midterm evaluation of five BOSS countries, Lesotho, Ethiopia, Malawi, Rwanda, and Tanzania, that show you the efficiencies gained, the savings, and the transaction cost reduction by applying the business operation strategies. And finally, the fifth imperative, making it very real. And this is where we come to using the common service packages. These are the actual building blocks in your implementation. They're both about quality and about cost reduction. So I would strongly urge you to use these packages, save time, learn from the best practices of others, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel yourself. The end goal is very clear. We want to make sure the UN has world-class operations that underpin our contribution to the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you. I don't hear you, uh, Luigi. Just reverse repeat the values, the dashboard you need, yeah. and then you just, of course, you have to interpret it on your own. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's all for me. Yes. Sorry, uh, we're sort of like working our way through some technical glitches here. Anyway, dear colleagues, thank you for joining us. Um, this is the first in a series of UNDG webinars titled Common Business Operations as a Source of UN Innovation which basically aims at raising awareness and outreach on common business operations field experiences and the standardized common service packages that capture and then scale these practices as off-the-shelf solutions. Um, as you know, this particular webinar will be on the solar uh, panel solutions. Now, the structure of the, these webinars will be as follows. You've just seen a five-minute video introduction by Kani Wignaraja, the UN DOCO director. Uh, to sort of place this in the context of the, the new SDGs and their impact on business operations in general. Uh, then now I will uh, uh, give you guys a, a brief 10-minute introduction to, uh, to the standardized common service packages, explaining what they do, what, uh, what, they, uh, what they exactly are. And then uh, this will be followed by a 15-minute presentation of uh, the good office that has kindly taken the lead in developing this package, uh, which in this case is UNDP's Global ICT Advisor Unit in Copenhagen. Um, then we will have a case study presented by a country office that has actually implemented or is currently implementing this particular package, which in this case is the country office, the UNDP country office in Timor Leste. Uh, this presentation will also be 15 minutes. And then we end the, the webinar with a Q&A session of about 15 minutes. In the meantime, uh, should you have any questions, um, I think there's a, there's a little chat box in your, in your uh, webinar tool. Uh, there you can type your questions and then uh, when the time comes for Q&A, we'll try to answer all of these. <coughs> So, what exactly is a common service package? Imagine your OMT decides to explore the possibility to achieve cost savings by replacing all light fixtures in the office with LED lights. Now, you as an operations manager, you're not a lighting technician or an electrician. So, how do you know which type of LED is suitable for your situation? How would you determine when a proposed lighting system would save you money and how much? if you have any cost savings at all. Wouldn't it be nice if you can draw on the experience of a country office that has already gone through the process and then learn from their experiences? Well, this is exactly what a common service package aims to do. 
Um, it's an off-the-shelf solution that OMTs and UNCTs can use to set up a specific common service without having to reinvent the proverbial wheel. It explains the various steps of the process. It outlines the requirements and or specifications or helps you determine uh, these for your specific context. It also tells you how to go about a feasibility study, so determining whether or not this exercise is going to give you value for money. Basically, this package is a comprehensive bundle of guidance documents that further contains tools to help you analyze your present uh, situation and whether the proposed solution is something that's actually going to work for your uh, UNCT. And it also has standardized templates for your convenience and best practices and lesson learned so you can read up on real life examples from other field offices. Um, there's a kind request to please mute all the microphones. We hear uh, some ambient noise, which is highly distracting. Thank you. So, how do we make a common service uh, package? So, UNDG is collecting country level experiences for a certain common service, then worked with a specific office that has ac actually implemented the operational service solution. In this case, it, uh, it's the UNDP Global, Advi uh, sorry, Global ICT Advisory Unit in Copenhagen. And together we cooked this package for you. We took two cups of uh, best practices and lesson learns, uh, mixed it with a healthy dose of standardizing the approach to the best extent possible, and then added a pinch of enough leeway to adjust the service solution to your local context. So the requirements of your specific situation and the capacities of your resources. Now, as for the reason why we're developing common service packages, many of you are familiar with the UNDG business operations strategy, the BOSS, which is the backbone of the operating as one pillar under the standard operating procedures for delivering as one, also known as the SOPS. As you know, harmonizing business operations under the BOSS has two major drivers. Reducing transaction costs and operational cost, increasing the quality of our operational services. And by implementing these common service packages, we do just that, reducing costs and enhancing quality. But common service packages also eliminate uh, duplication of efforts. There's no need for you to figure out all by yourself something that has already been done by others. The common service packages enable knowledge sharing and promote good practices across the UN system. And they improve the performance evaluation of your operational services as they reinforce the M&E mechanisms for harmonized business operations. How are uh, the common service packages structured? They basically consist of five main elements. There's a description of what the service solution is supposed to do. There's a business process map of setting up, of, of depicting the entire process of setting up the, the common service from beginning to end. Then there's a technical outline which takes the reader by the hand and then walk through the process step by step, sort of how-to guide, if you will. Then there's a portion on governance, which contains guidance on how this service solution should be managed. And then there's a, a, a section on billing, which provides guidance on cost recovery among agencies. The initial focus of the common service packages is uh, on particular service lines in three business operations areas. You can see here greening and fleet management, and then on the next slide I will also go into the ICT area. Uh, we looked at our completed BOSS frameworks, uh, particularly the baseline analysis and needs analysis, to determine the demand for certain services. This slide is basically an overview of what's been developed so far, what is in the pipeline. Uh, LED lighting is a, a package that's about to be finalized, while uh, another common service package on vehicle insurance is still under development. ICT 
In the area of ICT, there are three, uh, sorry, there are packages currently being developed in close collaboration with the ICT reference group. We are also working on, on setting up a common authentication platform called Common Connect. Uh, this is not a common service package per se, but more an agreement at corporate level, uh, which would allow every staff member to log in uh, to access common operation solution using their own agency-specific login. There would be no need for separate username uh, and password information. This is an enabling technology on, where, on which other common service solutions can be based. Now, the beauty is that tremendous amounts of cost savings can be generated since there's no uh, separate user account management. This remains with the staff member's uh, own agency. The common service packages are being developed under the supervision of the UNDG Task Force for Common Service Packages, which reports directly to the UNDG Business Operations Working Group. At present, the task force consists of many agencies, UN Women, UNFPA, WHO, FAO, UNODC, WFP, and UNDP. One last thing. These packages are a work in progress. Uh, they are updated as more information becomes available from field level on what works, what doesn't work. Uh, so in this context, if you have any questions, issues, or concern uh, that you may have with these packages developed so far, or if you have a best practice that you feel might benefit others, uh, please feel free to contact us. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll spread out uh, the, 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 this presentation and all the details. And that concludes my segment. Uh, let's switch to our colleagues in Copenhagen. Shut the shoe. Are you there? Jerel? Are they still on mute? Okay. Hello, okay, Copenhagen. Are you there? Uh, hello, everyone. We're just experiencing a little technical pause, but everything is fine. Luigi, do you want to? Yes, uh, I would like to give the word to uh, Copenhagen, Giral and Shu. Are you there? Yes. Lu Luigi, can you hear me? Yes, we can all hear you. Okay, uh, I think uh, the screen that you have to show, we, we all use the Gerald's link, so it's showing Gerald is connected several times. My one where there is uh, the presentation should be the third this the third one. Can you try another one besides the one that you connected, Luigi? One second. Hold on, okay. everyone. Oh, we're just switching. The third one first, second, third. We're trying the third one now. Let's see what comes up. Um, We're seeing a black screen that says end of slideshow. Is that the one? No. Are we no, looking at the screen now? No. No, that's not the right one. Is it possible maybe we, uh, I think there's some bit of mix up. What we can do is I'll only one of us connect. And yeah. We'll connect in the conference room with the round table. Yeah, but uh, now I need to. Present. Yeah, so maybe we could all come here. And yeah, we all yeah, we ca up. so yes. can you shut down yeah. and we all come in? Okay. Just give us a sec. Uh, there's several people connected using the same link, so I'm asking them to disconnect now and then we, we just use Guys, one. We do see something here. We do see something. We see UNDG common service packages on solar PV solutions. Presenters okay. are all new. Um, let's see. I've got several screens here. 
Oh, it's just the title. Okay. Yeah, maybe that's not it. Well, I can try um, the other options for there. You, your name is listed, Gerald, one, two, three, four, four times. times. Um, I'm, fourth I'm one? disconnecting everyone. I'm disconnecting everyone so we have one only. So just give us a sec. We should be okay. in a short one. Or should we go to Ismail now and then that will give them time? Yeah, sure. maybe that. Yeah. Mel, are you there? Yes, I am here. Okay, let's let's do you first. <clears throat> sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, you can do. It. Let me just turn on. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Show my screen. There we, there go. we go. Awesome. So you see my screen? Yes. Okay. And you hear me loud and clear? Yes. yes we Okay, I shall start then. Just give me a second. Okay, Luigi, shall I start? Yes, my is going ahead and then we'll come. Yes, Ishmael, go ahead. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ishmael Linan. Ismail. Uh, I am. Hello, Shatiso. Do you guys want to turn off your microphones? Okay, I'm going to continue. Uh, my name is Ishmael Linan. I, I'm project managing one of the solar energy projects in Timor Leste, which we are implementing in conjunction with UNDP uh, OIMT department in Copenhagen. Uh, I'll tell you briefly what we've been doing. Uh, I'll run through it a bit fast, but anyway, this is Equator line, and this is where Timor Leste is, as you can see. And we are very advantageous position in terms of solar energy. So what was the challenge? I'll start from this. Um, uh, UN agencies uh, live in a, quite a large compound in Timor and all the buildings are quite old and there's no insulation and there's no energy saving appliances. And this is a hot climate all year round and everybody's using ACs. Even now it's 9.30 p.m. I have my AC on. Uh, uh, there's a government supplement, supplemented local grid which is reliable. However, it is a bit costly. And you see the figures there. Lately, we paid all agencies paid almost uh, three hundred thousand dollars annually uh, for electricity only, which all make made up almost forty percent of common premises budget. And again, it's shared by all agencies. And we also have four no number large and two number uh, medium sized diesel generators. Uh, all together, they are causing approximately six hundred tons of carbon dioxide emissions to the planet yearly. So this is the challenge, what do we do about it? And we saw this as an opportunity and as being uh, the sustainable development goals on, uh, especially number seven, uh, with green energy, clean energy, and with favorable climate conditions and reliable year-round sunlight in Timor-Leste, and also advancement of solar and renewable energy technologies. We thought, especially the RC with his support and UNDP is interested in it, we thought we may use this energy and propose some a large-scale solar energy system for the UN house, which would benefit us uh, by cutting energy bills substantially, almost 40-50%, which I'll explain later, and it will also decrease pollution and greenhouse gases. In addition, it will enable UN agencies to move towards greener operations, basically, uh, they, it will demonstrate uh, UN's commitment by walking the talk in sustainability. And also, uh, the additional, maybe the most important benefit would be encouraging the government to promote solar energy in the country, which uh, they are at the moment, which uh, since we started, uh, they are using this project as a showcase as well. So hopefully we'll be working with them in the future too. So this is the opportunity to use solar uh, energy. What, uh, so we came up with a solution. Uh, we proposed a 300 kVP uh, powerful PV system, which would produce approximately 400 kilowatt hours clean energy annually, and it would cover almost 70 percent of our daytime consumption. Now, daytime, nighttime, I'm sticking to these words because we are only proposing a day, uh, system for a daytime consumption, which would have no battery, so nighttime is not required, and it will save almost uh, approximately 70 k. 70,000 annually from the current electricity bill. And then, of course, it with the taking out generators, it would approximately save uh, 250,000 
kilo, uh, kilograms of uh, carbon dioxide per year to the planet. The system uh, we were thinking, we were pro proposing would be a grid tight, which means it would work in, in conjunction with the local supply and it would have no battery and it would produce energy matching our consumption levels. Basically, as we consume, it would produce. If we don't consume, it wouldn't produce. And it would have a smart monitoring system, which is a very vital uh, element of the systems because then you can monitor, then you can control, then you can reduce your consumption. And uh, there will be, of course, an excess production because of no battery, and that would we cannot send it back to the national grid, uh, which is also uh, we are working with the government to establish such system. It would cost us approximately two hundred fifty, six hundred fifty thousand dollars to install with a pay, payback period of six, less than six years. So this was the solution, and uh, so we took it on board. And how did we progress? UNDP OM developed the seven uh, stage uh, steps uh, process, which we followed them. Although I have to say this project is independently carried out by the country office, but we are working uh, with UNDP OIMT uh, and using their expertise and their common uh, services package is very, very important for us. So what we did first, we did a self-assessment. So we uh, brought a solar energy expert to Timor-Leste in 2014 and uh, he pre pro, uh, prepared a potential PV energy analysis for the UN house. And from his report, uh, we began recording consumption figures, basically recording how much we're consuming during the day, during the night. Uh, I have to say again, at that time, we did not have the uh, correct equipment, so we could do it manually, but we, it was carried out strictly, so we have a really good, reliable data. Not exactly detailed, but uh, it's still uh, very usable for uh, design. And we also looked at funding options and cost sharing modalities investigated. Again, this is very important in a common services packages, especially in a common premises, common uh, shared services uh, environment. After the self-assessment, uh, the second stage was business case. Again, in this one, we common premises unit and OMT, uh, sorry, uh, UNDP OMT worked together. What we did, we prepared a project proposal based on the report and uh, in early 2015. And also we agreed a budget uh, for 300 uh, kvp turn turnkey PV system and presented the UNCT in mid-2015, which was accepted uh, with, uh, within those parameters and we went for a RFP procurement method. This was a challenge to decide if either we do RFP, RFQ, ITB, etc. But we decided because this is a system uh, we don't have the knowledge as much and the companies and the technology is out there. Uh, a company can provide us a pr proposal, provide us a solution and provide a turnkey system. Uh, and following that one, the procurement started in July 2015. So the third stage, uh, procurement stage. Again, in this one, CP unit and UNDP uh, operations work together. Uh, through the RFP, we received four proposals from international vendors, one disqualified, and we also uh, set up a technical evaluation committee from, again, uh, UNDP's OIMT, uh, solar expert from them, UNDP's con uh, country of the climate change expert, and uh, from the CP unit, uh, myself, a civil engineer. Uh, so we did the evaluation, and at the end of the evaluation, we decided GSOL, a company called GSOL from Denmark, which is very experienced in these projects and in which they've been working with UNDP and other agencies throughout the world, I say. And they were the winners, and we declared them in, in September 2015. That was approved by UNDP's Regional Asset and Contract Procurement Department in December 2015, because this is... Um, Although this is a common premises uh, project, this has to be done through an agency and UNDP is the service provider, so we went through their systems. Uh, following the RFP, uh, RFP approval, an inter-agency committee, AIC, set up among, among participating agencies in January 2016. This is very important because we wanted all the agencies involved take part and have a voice and not only leave to UNDP, but and uh, be part of the project from uh, from get go, and therefore uh, AIC uh, appointed UNDP as the project manager uh, to sign a contract and implement, implement the project. Uh, now um, there is also an expert team set up uh, through uh, agencies, participating agencies, to assist UNDP 
basically one uh, civil uh, works for from ILO, one for solar systems from UNICEF, which is, is in New York actually, and UNDP project manager for system design. So basically, from through New York, through Cap Copenhagen, through uh, Delhi, Timor Leste, we've been managing this project in technical terms. So the first fourth stage was vendor site survey. Now we have a project, we have a budget, we have a vendor. But we have a proposal, but we don't know exactly the details of the system. So vendor needed to come and do a site survey. So selected vendor came, uh, their engineers, two of the engineers came and visited the site in February 2016. You see on the right hand side our uh, site, uh, our compound, uh, and that's a large, quite a large compound. And we selected the middle car parking two section as the perfect location uh, for. Uh, to install the panels. Uh, GISOL uh, prepared and submitted a preliminary site visit report and they identified a local partner and in, uh, installation locations and a mounting structure and uh, site specific system sizing and also modifications to current power setup. Because this is a quite an old setup, quite an old compound, uh, things need to be changed but uh, the company, the vendor uh, site survey revealed some modifications that needed to be done, which we are working on them now. So we did the uh, site survey. So following that one, we the fifth stage was design stage. In the design stage, uh, ET expert team and GISO, uh, the company worked together. And also, uh, and we developed a site-specific PV design. And also we uh, designed a car park structure uh, and also included a smart monitoring system. I have to emphasize on the car park structure. Initially, uh, companies didn't want to, uh, didn't plan to install the uh, solar panels on, in a car park structure, but they initially decided to put it on our buildings, but our buildings are not strong enough. And also we strongly recommended to use a car park structure to benefit from the shade thing as well, because this is a hot country, and also we have enough space and it would benefit UN um, vehicles to park underneath and also stop the drivers to turn the engines on just to keep the cars cool enough for the international stuff. So it, hopefully it will work and it will save more uh, diesel and more use less carbon dioxide. And uh, following that one, we did a few value, value engineering from the design and we omitted some unnecessary components and we looked at the battery add-on options because initially we didn't want the battery, but we thought we may have a look at it and at the end we did, decided not to do it, but we looked at it. And the design completed in May 2016. And that design was proposed to AIC and accepted and endorsed by, in June 2016. So that's the design stage. Uh, the next stage now is the implementation. Uh, that in implementation, UNDP and GSOL are working together. At the moment, UNDP country office signed a contract with GSOL for the provision of a turnkey 300 kV PV solar system for UN House early in July 2016. Currently, the car park structure construction started just last week, actually, and we already made some changes in design due to unforeseen uh, conditions. So this is very ex uh, typical and expected in, a, in any construction project, but soon, in a, in a month or two months' time, we will have our car park structure up and the solar panels will be installed by September. And uh, let's say by November, we should have the system up and running and uh, first of December, we should have clean energy being uh, uh, diverted into our offices. So this is the stages, but I'm going to focus on the design stage again. So that's all good, but what are we installing in detail? Um, we're installing actually 301.6 kilowatt per kvp uh, power per PV system, which uh, is using almost uh, 1,200 uh, 260 uh, watt uh, panels and 14 furnace inverters. It will produce approximately 480,000 kilowatt hours energy annually. Again, because we're not using, we cannot consume all of it because of the consumption matching uh, conditions around 80,000 of uh, that uh, kilowatt hour will be surplus. The remaining 400,000 will cover 75% of our annual daytime consumption. Only daytime, not nighttime, because we have no batteries. Production dependent on the sunlight and the consumption level. Basically, if the consumption is higher than the solar production, grid, local grid will top up. If the consumption is less than solar production, 
the surplus energy will be blocked. This is typically consumption will be higher in the morning because we all come at 8, 9, 9 a.m., 5 to 9. We turn our computers, we turn our uh, ACs, the uh, consumption go, spikes up, but the sun is not up there yet. And vice versa, the other thing is consumption is very little uh, around lunchtime because everybody goes home in Timor Leste. Quite a nice uh, thing, actually. So we don't have much consumption during the lunch, but we have a, quite a large production. Uh, uh, in addition, uh, we uh, thought about the batteries, uh, but uh, for to use that 8,000 uh, kilowatt hours of surplus energy, um, it is still a consideration. But due to costs and um, funding reasons, we, we may not implement it. But it's uh, again, as I said, not part of our initial design. So that was the PV system. But what about the car park structure? Again, you see the photos on the right hand side, and uh, the bottom is their design. The photo, real photo, is a sample. It's 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 just the show. Where the top right hand is our model. We developed a site-specific steel structure as a car park shading, which will be right in the middle of the compound, which will have a will keep all the PV panels in one place, which is actually a, a very good option for solar production. Local construction methods will be used in this, uh, and it will be a visibly unanimous installation. And especially when you, when anybody, any, any VIPs or any uh, seminar or any conference meeting uh, guests come into our site, they will go through this uh, structure. And especially government officials will go and see this, and it will be a little bit of an advertisement on marketing. Uh, it will, by doing it as a car park structure, it will leave room for further future expansion. We can use buildings, we can use other uh, areas. It may also provide local private sector growth. Basically, we made it a condition uh, for the uh, vendor, international vendor, to use a local partner, which they, for their not only for electrical but for the civil works as well, which uh, at the moment currently being implemented. It will of course lo uh, provide local employment opportunities. As of today, we had 25 people working on that structure, and then it will leave, of course, more dollars to the country. Uh, this is the car park structure. That's the system. But how much energy the system is producing? This is a, a big chart, big graph. But I will briefly talk about this. Uh, the yellow is the solar production estimated. The, the bars are our consumption. The gray is daytime consumption. Blue is the nighttime consumption. For the moment, don't worry about the lines. What this basically says is, this has been measured since August 2014 to February 2016. What basically shows us is, in a month like January 2015, our production matches our consumption. So that's a perfect month. But it's not always the same. In May 2015, for example, our production was less than our uh, consumption. In that case, Again, uh, the grid would supply more. But there are better months. Uh, for example, September. In September, we produce more energy than we consume. But what happens to that extra energy? It goes surplus. It will be blocked. Anyway, this is what uh, the system will do. What about the financial costs and benefits? The acquisition cost for the system is 513,000, 514,000 nearly. And also, in addition to that acquisition, and the contractors, the vendors, uh, will have another contract for LTA, long-term agreement, for monitoring, maintenance, and support, technical support, for almost 20 years, which will come to around 43,000. And also, there's a project management cost of 50,000, and the total project cost came to 607,400. And these are the financial costs and shared by all agencies. What about the benefits? Uh, it would benefit uh, a, almost uh, 86,000 annually from electricity bill, bill plus 46,000 from generator maintenance service because we won't need generators as much, so therefore less service. A total of 132,000 savings to all UN agencies, which would almost be approximately uh, a 50% reduction in the bill. Return of investment would be under five years, better than what we expected, and total savings over the lifespan would be 2.2 million, which is quite a good number, and everybody loved this, uh, looking at this number. It, it's also, uh, the environmental benefits is will save the, uh, the planet 285,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide per year. In addition to that one, because of uh, the marketing, the 
using uh, uh, energy c consumption uh, measures uh, on top of the solar panels, we will, pro we will uh, reduce our carbon dioxide emissions further. So how do we pay for it? This is, uh, again, a, a big question asked by all the other interested agencies. How do we manage um, a common uh, service project? It's not only done by UNDP, but all the agencies contribute. The UNA House indeed is occupied by nine agencies and possibly ten with the, uh, uh, in the future with WFPs um, um, joining us. And there's a common premises unit set up under an MOU with a cost sharing agreement by all agencies. Basically, we share every cost based on the percentage of office space occupied per agency. The solar project, uh, energy project, was uh, proposed as part of common premises and included in the CP budget 2015. Uh, UNDP, as the service provider, as the project manager, created a, a separate fund uh, for other agencies to make the payments and debit advice is issued and the money has been uh, transferred. So we have the money, we have the contract, we have the contractor, the work is ongoing now. Agencies strongly encouraged to participate in the projects and, and this project also used as a um, advertisement or marketing for other agencies that are not part of the common premises at the moment. Uh, actually they find this uh, quite a good advantageous position to be in the compound uh, likes of WFP which is a major uh, agency they are moving in hopefully. And also agencies leaving the project continue, will continue to contribute to CP budget based on current local supply electricity rates. So if people want to leave, they are free, but we are strongly discouraged. So uh, my last thing maybe, what were the challenges? So, all okay, good, we've done this many stages, but uh, there were, were some challenges. Managing different agencies with different expectations, different funding structures was a challenge, which I suppose everywhere is the same. No concrete commitment from all agencies initially. It took us a while to convince them, to show them what's the benefits and uh, in that case again UNDP's, uh, UNDP OIM's uh, involvement at these stages and also UNDG's uh, guidelines helped a lot. Sourcing technical expertise in solar systems, especially design and procurement was a difficult challenge, especially locally there is not much and I learned a lot during this project. <laughs> Hopefully I'll benefit other projects soon. Agreeing on a suitable procurement method, as I mentioned earlier, was a challenge and finally we went for RFP. Lack of country office procurement and management, especially procurement expertise in similar projects. This is a small country and we don't have uh, much of an experience in similar projects uh, or bigger construction projects like this. The most challenging was long decision making periods. This is, I think, a case for um, each country office and uh, we experienced this here as well. Uh, procedural issues or uh, personal issues, it took a long time to make decisions, but yeah, we finally got it. No governmental support or legislation in place. There was that. Uh, at the moment, currently, uh, again, UNDP initiative, the government is trying to put a, a renewable energy law, which, again, we are using this solar energy project uh, as a case study for them as well. Basically, the project hasn't started yet, hasn't finished yet, but it's already created a government interest and hopefully it will result in a law. Capacity of local business is not enough and limited to small scale projects. Uh, which this is a challenge and which we will experience more in the coming weeks. Geographical constraints, which is the distance and time difference was a major uh, part. We are actually invited third, almost 30 companies, only four or five came back with uh, proposals and also uh, the, the shipping and the time difference for even uh, having a technical support is a bit difficult. And no involvement or incentives from the government. Uh, there is no buyback agreement, therefore there's, there is no benefit from the government from us. But again, this is as part of the, the renewable energy law, we are working with the government as a, uh, to install, to set up a buyback agreement for uh, the public. So that's all from me and if you have any questions please contact and I'll be here and I'll answer everything one by one. Thank you. Thanks Ishmael. Uh, speaking of questions, uh, I hope all of you are aware that there's a, a question box in your, you could type your questions. I see actually a question from Almir Moreira in Brazil about uh, whether or not there was a battery bank added to this project. 
Um, would you like taking a question, Ishmael? I can. I can't see the question uh, section, but I. It's not on the okay. chat. No. He's asking, was okay. the battery added to the project? No, initially we did not want battery uh, because we have a reliable uh, power supply here, grid supply, and battery would, if we added battery, it would have uh, created more cost but not much benefit. We still thought about this during the design stage, but the cost uh, benefit analysis um, did not uh, justify it, so we did not consider uh, batteries. Okay, I I hear a note from Lars. Please note, UNDP is talking to Tesla for an LTE on their new battery technology. Yes, yeah, we are aware of this. Yes. Yeah, no, so I was speaking to Guys. UNDP to Bruce and uh, Jens Wandel uh, last week on uh, on several mm -hmm. things, including the common service packages, mm -hmm. and they mentioned they actually traveled to California. Uh, some people get the really nice trips, it seems, uh, to to Tesla to their factories. Nevada does it. <laughs> Well, you have to be there once in your life, I guess. Yeah, I passed and, by the uh, factory. <laughs> yeah, it's it's they they spoke even to Musk and uh, the top level there, and what they're trying, what they're aiming to do is to um, Tesla has released the patents mm -hmm. on their new battery technology. Well, mm -hmm. not the newest, but one of the older generations. It was bigger than news actually. Mm -hmm. And UNDP together, I think, with some of the other agencies, are looking to set up an LTA uh, for the battery, so that when you were saying the surplus production, uh, mm -hmm. that we can actually either store it and, uh, even if needed, feed it back into the grid. Yeah, um, that's true. Which I just wanted to add as a as a footnote, uh, complementing your otherwise excellent uh, presentation. Over. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, guys, we uh, we now are really running out of time. We only have like uh, a few minutes left. I would now like to give word to uh, to Copenhagen and give uh, 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 time for for their uh, presentation. Shatishu Giral, if you could condense and and sort of like highlight uh, the the key points to your presentation, would be grateful. I'm very very sorry. We've had some uh, some technical glitches and we have to go over time. We have a leeway of about 10 minutes. We can go like 10 past 9 uh, New York time. Uh, so about 15 more minutes. And uh, in the meantime, if you have questions, just type them up and we'll make sure that the, all of these get answered one way or another. Thank you. Over to you, Copenhagen. Yes, uh, thank you, Louis. So I guess we won't go through then the, um, the full presentation. So we'll just uh, flip through the slides and uh, and and perhaps cover just one or two uh, two main points, but uh, we won't go through the full uh, presentations. So the way it's going to work, I think, um, we're going to try to have a, a good flow from the presentation of Louis um, by uh, saying, okay, now that Louis has highlighted uh, the importance and the benefits of having a package that can be reused by all the agency and not having to amend the will. Here's one package that we believe uh, could be beneficial for you to use. And this is if you do decide to install solar panels, here's the package. And then um, we'll say the package consists of seven steps and behind each of these steps there are uh, various procedures, form, templates, tender, tools, uh, so on and so forth, and we will be quickly uh, go through some of these uh, under these seven steps by giving you the current status of it, and as this is a continuous improvement process, uh, the future plan. So very quickly, Shatiso. Yeah. Uh, can can you confirm field. you can see the presentation? Okay. Uh, I assume you can see the presentation. If you can't, you let me know. Uh, the seven steps, how we have them in UNDP. Maybe I should start off by saying we've got a, a bunch of uh, tools like Gerald has just mentioned, um, and they are all consolidated, at least for UNDP, uh, under one intranet space. Um, and we also have online ordering system and stuff like that. So without wasting time on that one, I'll go straight to the seven steps. Uh, as UNDP, OM2 have close to two years of exposure, and this we started this on uh, when we had uh, this uh, 
uh, Ebola outbreak and we have made quite some significant progress which is what I want to give you as we go through this, uh, uh, these seven steps for this package. And I should say um, this conforms really to from what was said in the first presentation the, the criteria or the characteristics of a common services uh, package. So you'll see it as we go through uh, maybe critical. Uh, for the first step, which is the self-assessment, we've had the, um, the case from uh, East, East Timor. They followed this uh, process and these are the steps that they were going through. So for the self-assessment, the current Status, we have the installation of the power consumption monitoring and measurement tool. This package, we are rolling it out to all the country offices and it gives the precise um, cons patterns. Uh, from uh, ESO's uh, presentation, we had they made some rough calculations and made a few assumptions. There is no need for that now. We have the current tool that can actually give us the precise information. And as part of the data collection, we also have what we call a preliminary site survey template, which is filled by the office that needs the installation of the solar panels. And for UNDP specific, we have an online data gathering system called the ICT registry as well. For the future, for this particular step, um, we are planning to consolidate all these um, desperate um, um, data collection systems, put them into one so that it's uh, easier even for for the office that is installing to provide us with the uh, information that we need. You will see at the bottom left of each screen, we are just stating there the parties that are involved in each step. Like in this case, for instance, it's us here and the country office for the step one process. Uh, the second step, or rather before that, this is just a screenshot of uh, the power consumption monitoring tool. It gives you a whole lot of information and the, the clock on the bottom left, if you click, it shows you the different reports that you can get from this tool. So this is part of uh, one of the tools that we use for step one. And going to step number two, which is the business case. Now that we know the consumption pattern in a country office, daytime, nighttime, winter, uh, summer, and so forth, we have to make a case here to say, is it worthy to install? Which, of course, it is worthy. But just saying it's worthy is not enough. We want to tell the story in figures and facts, which uh, will be there for everyone to see. So that's the idea behind the business case. We make a business case, show the savings that will be done, and uh, show the payback time and all the advantages of having a specific or a, a local office to adopt solar installation. So that's the idea behind the business case. And currently, we are doing it manually, the data consolidation. We do it manually. We create a load profile, uh, and we present that to the local office for decision making. The, the plan for the future is to try to automate this uh, business case production. And uh, the idea for now is we are thinking around the power consumption monitoring and measuring portal, which is a cloud-based system. We are thinking of consolidating everything around that portal so that it's a bit quicker. And I should state that the figures that we also present in a business case it's to do with the dollar figures, which will actually help in uh, decision making for the local uh, management in the country office. So that's the business case. And just to give you an idea of what we've had so far, I've got these two cases for uh, South Sudan and Afghanistan. You can see the figures that we came up with. The initial investment, the, solar, the number of solar panels, the capacity that each system will, will produce and the coverage in terms of the total consumption, how much can the system provide? Like, uh, does it cover 100%? Like in the case of South Sudan, it's covering 100% and for Afghanistan, 60.5%. The annual savings, the break-even uh, period, like how long it will take for them to get their investment back. You can see South Sudan is three years, and it's mainly because they rely on generators, so it's, it's quite uh, 
beneficial for them to, to take on this uh, project. And just for the sake of it, we see how many staff members are in the country office that can be served by this system. So all this is uh, things that we provide in a business case. Um, going to the third uh, step, I know I'm moving very fast. I hope you catch uh, everything properly. Uh, step number three, which is the procurement and cost proposal. Uh, this is where after the uh, local office has said, okay, we've seen the business case and we are giving you a green light to go ahead to the next step. Then that's when we have um, the procurement uh, colleagues come in to assist us with the uh, procurement of the system. What does it involve? We have uh, the business case approval, which is uh, the, the critical ingredient for us to get started on this. And then we do a, a request for quotations, and we call it secondary bidding. Why? Because we've got seven LTA vendors that have a, an agreement with us to provide a 10 key solar solution. So to get the best deal for each case, we just don't go to one vendor and say, can you install in such a country office? We put them into competition through this uh, secondary bidding. and. Um, it's just a way to get the best deal, really, because at the end of the day, there are LTA holders and their, their proposals have been acceptable. So it's just to get the best deal per country office and you put them in competition as it were. Um, we do the vendor selection and we make sure as part of the LTA requirement that selected vendor has a local partner within that country where we have an installation. I mean, for the obvious reasons, when we need someone on site, it's got to be quick and cheap. So they need to establish Shutish. local partners. Yes? Shutish. Sorry to interrupt you. We have, we have like two minutes left for this presentation. Then we have to move okay. into questions. OK, that's fine. Thank you. Um, and then the plans, I guess you can read along on that one. Number four is the vendor site survey. The vendor does the site survey again. Uh, coming up with the final figures and the plan is to standardize and have uh, templates and also assess. We, uh, we want to engage the uh, engineers without borders just for additional expertise. Number five, um, the design step. It would really be a back and forth until we have uh, a final design, final approval with the country office. Step number six, the installation. The main thing there we can do, uh, we do continuous uh, monitoring and review as we reach the, um, the milestones that we have agreed with the, with the vendor. This is just to give you pictures of what is on the ground really. Um, so yes. Number seven, uh, operations and maintenance. I think this one is critical just to mention that, you know, we have online monitoring tools and we also have established a help desk, which does daily monitoring, first level support, remote management. And we, we have plans, of course, to improve on that. You can see that on the, on the, on the screen there. Um, this is a picture of an online monitoring uh, tool uh, for the ones that have completed. In this case, I think this should be Sierra Leone or Guinea. It's, a, it's something that is live, but I just took a, a, a screenshot of that. So, um, yes, and this one just defines the workflow for our incident management. Um, future plans, training for, for all the stakeholders, the different uh, stakeholders that you have. Thank you. I'm not sure if I met the one minute or not, Luigi. Thank you, Shatishu. All right. Now we'll take five questions. Uh, any additional questions? We'll just uh, we'll just answer by email uh, after the presentation. Go ahead, Maria. Uh, good. Hello. We lost. We lost uh, Maria. Can you hear us, uh, Luigi? Hello. Can you hear? Yes. Now we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so our first question here is from Almir Moreira, and his question is, panels are installed in a roof model construction. How are you planning to do the maintenance of the panels? 
And I think this question is to Israel. Yeah, but I think uh, also uh, Copenhagen is very okay. uh, qualified to answer. Either one. Yes. Um, in a solar panel installation, you can say that you have three different components. Um, the solar panels, uh, the inverters and the management system, and the batteries. Um, the maintenance of the solar panels is the easiest part. Their life expectancy is over 20 years, and all they need is to be uh, clean, uh, regularly depending on the local condition so if there are if there is dust that is accumulating it is clean so that is the only um, maintenance requirement for the solar panels uh, for all the inverters and electronics and controllers and so on um, it is pretty well all maintenance free and also the life expectancy is uh, is many years uh, the complicated part are the batteries. The batteries, per se, they are maintenance free, but they must be kept in a controlled environment, so the temperature of the room is not too high, and you have to be very careful on uh, managing the charging and charging of the batteries so uh, you don't damage your batteries. And the life expectancy of the batteries depending on all these criteria can vary between a few years, two or three years, to about 10 years. Um, so so that, that's the answer on, on the maintenance required and the like maintenance. On the batteries, I could talk about it for, for a few hours, but right now we are using acid-lead batteries for most of our solar panel installation, simply because um, they are the cheapest one. Uh, on the market, so this is where you get the best uh, total cost of ownership. But um, uh, more and more, the lithium battery are becoming uh, much, much more competitive from a point of view, uh, from a cost point of view, and from a performance point of view. Uh, yes, they are much more, much more efficient. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Jerome. Uh, the next question is from uh, FAO in Rome, uh, our colleague Tina Mittendorf. Uh, the question is, did you foresee cleaning of the panels? We here at FAO think that this is an important issue. Yes, yes. So at the time of, and you actually foresee that from the inception of the problem, uh, the, of, the, of the project. So when you do your site survey, you have to consider access to the solar panel for the purpose of cleaning them. So this is where it starts. It starts at step number one, self-assessment under the pre-site survey. Um, and then when you have the actual design, also you have to make sure that the solar panels are installed in such a way that you can walk through them in order to clean them. Uh, and that's part of the design. Uh, and during the, uh, the, the, the vendor, sorry, the vendor site survey and, and, and the, the, the step five, which is the design. And um, finally, during the operation and maintenance, you, again, depending on the location, uh, if it is a rainy place where there's a lot of wind, you probably don't need to clean them very often, uh, maybe once a year or something like that. If it is a very dry and dusty, uh, dusty area, such as maybe Niger, um, this is something you want to plan every uh, month or every quarter. And again, it is very easy to clean. You just need to spray them with a bit of water and have a squeegee just to, uh, to wipe them. Uh, so it, it is as easy, if not easier, uh, as uh, cleaning windows. Uh, because it's easier than cleaning windows because you can just walk and clean the solar panels. With windows, you need to actually uh, go, go down the wall to, to wash them. Thank you. Thanks, Jérôme. Um, the next question is, uh, hold on. What if all offices are not located in one premises but still want a smaller system? Can the selected vendor be consulted to provide technical feedback? Yes, absolutely. Our installation are scalable from a few solar panels to 
thousands of solar panels. So if you have uh, installation in different buildings in different location, uh, that is not a problem to have a single vendor that would do separate installation for each of uh, the location. The criteria when you talk to distance, what is important to know is that the solar panels must be very close to your inverters and your batteries, meaning your technical room where you put all the, the hardware. Uh, otherwise, you have too much loss between the solar panels and, and, and this equipment. So in terms of distance or location, that's all you need to worry about. Short distance between your solar panels and your technical room where you install your inverters and batteries. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the next question is, as part of cost recovery from UN agencies, what will be the menu of cost drivers? Staff headcount, space utilization, or consumption usage? Yes, that's another very good question. The, um, the, the pricing model uh, can use different, can use different ways. The, the one that is the easiest is simply to uh, proportion that by headcounts. Because on average, uh, um, an agency of 100 people versus 50 people will just use the double of power. Another way, then you can make it a little bit complicated. You can make a mix like we do here in Copenhagen, the number of staff and the uh, space of the agencies. Uh, because this is also a very big driver for energy consumption, the pace that you occupied, particularly because of heating and air conditioning. In most of the warm countries, 80% 80 80 of your uh, power consumption will be air conditioning. So they would have a tendency to choose that, uh, that model for the pricing, the area that you use. If you want to be very precise, you have, of course, and you can actually automate this, you can use the PCMN, the Power Consumption Monitoring and Measurement system that you have. And you just measure each floor for each of the agencies, and automatically at the end of each month, you have how much power each of the agency has, uh, has consumed, and you just divide that uh, a proportion that between all the agencies. That's why in step number one, we have the installation of PCMM, because, because this will give you scientific, clear, precise data of your power consumption, which you can use in your step number two, your business case, to define your model on how you're going to a proportion cost between agencies based on the power consumption that you have measured with the PCMM, uh, let alone, of course, using this data for for determining uh, for uh, sizing your your uh, and designing your solar panel installation but the PCMM is also very important for business purposes such as uh, knowing how many each individual agencies or even floors or even appliance uh, are consuming so the PCMM is huge in terms of um, benefits uh, not only to help design the solar panel installation, but to identify where you can, where you're actually spending your, your electricity. You know what they say, you cannot manage what you don't measure. So if you don't measure your energy precisely, uh, how can you start having a solution to reduce your consumption? Because the greenest kilowatt is not solar panels. That's the southern greenest kilowatt. -er. The greenest kilowatt -er is the one that you, you do not use. So the PCMM will point you in the right direction to say, look, 80% of your electricity is air conditioning. You can cut that in half easily if you have motion detection, so air conditioning turns off when there's nobody at the office. If you go from 21 degrees setting to 23 degrees setting in your office, and then you see every day how much your power consumption is influenced by these measures. So this is very exciting. It has a very strong psychological impact when the staff comes in in the morning and they say, yesterday we took one, we consumed 100 
kilowatt hour, today only 80. And we save 20 kilowatt hour just by asking you to increase your air conditioning from 21 to 22 degrees. And then you can play all with this and have a good uh, marketing tool um, for all these purposes. So PCMM is, is, is pretty well gave you all these possibilities. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, actually, uh, we're really running late. One last question. Any additional question, we'll just answer by email. I have an, uh, a question from Anthony Wadueque. How would the UN system want to handle the excess energy they produced at certain times of the year? It is interesting because, in my opinion, the excess should be sold back as a way of recouping investment or given free as part of corporate social responsibility. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And we've been thinking a lot about that. There are three ways to deal with excess energy. Number one, you store the energy. But the cost for storing energy is very high. So far, also, the only way we know for storing the energy, or the most practical one, is with batteries. Um, there are other ways where you can use a hydro uh, system where you pump water in a reservoir, which you can actually use for electricity later. But that's for huge project, and this is extremely expensive. But that's the first way to deal with excess energy. First is to store it. Second way is to use net metering. But for this, it only works in very advanced uh, country where they have a grid that can accept uh, power. Um, so yet, that may be something that UN organization that have excess energy can use as a pilot in country offices to feed back to, uh, to the country. And this pilot can be a precedent, and then it can open the door for other uh, organizations that have solar panels to sell back their excess energy to the grid. And that is obviously the best way to deal with uh, excess uh, energy. The third way is what you have proposed, is that we take a cable from the UN compound and run it to a neighbor, a school as part of our a donation and corporate social responsibility. But this is very touchy for a couple of reasons. First, you need to do a safe installation because when you run cape, electrical cables uh, between various uh, properties, uh, there is a risk there. Um, second, also, you're only going to provide them with your excess power. So you're sort of only teasing them because they could be like two or three weeks without power because there is no sun uh, after six months where they became dependent on you and they got used to having free energy and then they let go their generator or whatever way they had before to have uh, electrical power and then when you no longer have access then they are in a very difficult place. So if we do that we really have to make sure that um, we don't create a dependency that make them vulnerable when you don't have uh, excess uh, power. Thank you. All right, and uh, we're coming to the end of this uh, this webinar. Uh, apologies uh, to all for the technical glitches. Um, this is our first time, so it didn't go as smoothly as uh, as we would wish for. Uh, but we'll uh, we'll have a, a better one next time. Uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you, uh, panelists, for your presentations. Uh, I'll make sure uh, I'll circulate questions and answers uh, after uh, after this webinar uh, via email, and I'll also uh, make available a recording of this webinar. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.